Professor Walid uh, Faris is joining me tonight uh, in the Capital TV show. He's a foreign policy expert. Uh, Professor Faris, how are you? Thank you for having me today. Thank you so much. You said the next uh, trick of the Iran lobby uh, to confuse the U.S. Uh, public, the Biden administration must sign the Iran deal fast before the next government is formed in Tehran. Now we have a new government, new president. What is the difference? The difference is that the Iran lobby, and let me explain what that is, all those uh, forces, political, social, economic, who have an interest uh, in that the Iran deal is signed because they want to go into the Iranian markets. And these lobbies are putting tremendous pressure on the Biden administration to go and sign the deal. First of all, before the elections, it did not go their way. Now, they are getting a new trick, a new argument before the president of Iran takes over. What they're trying to say is put pressure on the American public. to Tell them, let's go quickly, sign the deal, otherwise it's gonna be very difficult. Mm -hmm. And that's what unfortunately some members of the uh, Biden administration, including Secretary of State Blinken, Blinken yeah. are uh, arguing. And I'm arguing the other way. I'm saying on the contrary, we need to make sure that we have an alliance in the region that would check that deal and then we will go to negotiations. So it's the same regime, nothing changed. Obviously, that's what I've argued that should it be this president, the past president, all the way back to Ahmadinejad, the real leader mm -hmm. of the Iranian regime is Ayatollah Khamenei. Mm -hmm. And the real government in that regime is the Pazdaran, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. Yes, of course. You said on your Twitter account, ironic how the pro uh, Iron Deal media think tanks, academics are actually analyzing the selection of elected Raisi as a normal election is a normal country. So you, you think this is not abnormal? What's going on there? It's very abnormal. It has been abnormal for many years. Uh, we tried to correct it under the previous administration. And even then it was not corrected. What part of the mainstream media in Washington, and, and you, know, you know that you live here well, Mm -hmm. uh, has been trying to do is to support and push for the Iran deal. So what they try to frame it by saying, uh, mm -hmm. you know, this is an election. We have an elected official, elected president. So let's go and analyze what will be the trend. What are they analyzing? As we just said earlier, this is a president who was selected actually by the Grand Ayatollah through mm -hmm. these elections that would you know, remind us of the elections in Syria with the regime of uh, Bashar al-Assad or during the Cold War, the elections in the Soviet Union where the Communist Party would choose uh, all the prime ministers, the heads of states and so on and so forth. So mm -hmm. my argument is let's not fool the American public. This is not a regime that is elected democratically. That's why I tweeted uh, that tweet. Mm -hmm. You said also congressional opposition to removing sanction on the Iran regime and intensifies, but expect the Biden administration to move, remove more sanction, allow more cash to flow into Iran uh, coffers. So are we facing more uh, terrorist attacks in the region, especially now we, we saw the Houthis uh, attacking and uh, in, uh, on Saudi territories? Here's the problem. Here's the problem. The more we allow cash to go to the Iranian regime. And that's what, unfortunately, the administration is doing. But they're doing it for a reason, which in my view is, a, is, is wrong. They're saying we're going to allow those third countries to send some, to free some of the cash to the Iran regime. It will show our good intention. They will make concessions. It has never worked. And the Obama administration, it gave them $150 billion. Mm -hmm. What did they do with it? They bought more weapons. They bought advanced ballistic missiles. They funded the militias in control of Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and now you just mentioned uh, the Houthis. So every act of concession we make to the pro-Iranian militias in the region will translate into Iran becoming more aggressive, more demanding. They will take the money and then buy the weapons. So that's why I have been recommending here, and that's why, as you just mentioned, there are members in Congress now, not just Republicans, but also Democrats who are addressing the administration and telling them if the Iran regime doesn't change behavior, we're not gonna reward them with more cash and with the signing or re-signing of the Iran deal. Mm -hmm. You said also that if the Biden administration doesn't stop the Iranian military shipment by sea to Venezuela and Cuba, will the Iran uh, regime send another we uh, weapons shipment after this one? They on don't only send weapons, they send only drugs. So yeah. how, how the uh, Biden administration should deal with this issue? 
See, the Iran regime uh, tried to do it even under the Trump administration. They actually sent two ships, and unfortunately, even the previous administration did not stop them. Now, to stop the Iran regime from sending those ships, you're going to intercept these ships. To intercept these ships, meaning you are taking action. So maybe some of the you know, policy engineering or architects have advised not to engage in a full confrontation with the Iranian regime. Mm. Well, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, we did not engage. I mean, the U.S. did not engage the Soviet Union, but showed strength. What's mm. happening now is the Biden administration is going from concession to concession and by allowing Tehran to send weapons, and as you just said, drugs and maybe cash to the Venezuelan regime, it's doing two things. It's number one, it is breaking all the sanctions on Iran. You know, they're sending ships. Second, it's breaking the sanctions on the uh, Venezuela regime, and it's becoming dangerous because it can bring weapons not just to countries in the Middle East, mm. but here next door in the Caribbean, in Venezuela. So that is very, very perturbing, and I can tell you many members of Congress are not very happy with what they say. Mm-hmm. The current, you said also the current administration wants to display a tough stance on human rights within Western coalitions, but in fact, the actual relation will be influenced by U.S. companies' interests. Who are these companies? What are you talking about? Look, many media are asking me to come and give a list of these companies. This is not yet the time, but mm-hmm. with you, I'm going to go a little bit further and help our public to understand. The okay. same companies that pressured the Obama administration to actually conclude the Iran deal. I'm talking about 2013 to 2015. Mm -hmm. They want to enter the Iranian market. Those companies are still the same. They are behind the return to the Iran deal. Why? Because they're going to go inside the Iranian market with that regime. You know, Mm -hmm. for companies to go into a market, you have to compete. But if you conclude a deal, if they lobby for that regime and for that deal, they will have facilities. This reminds us of the 50s. Uh, how, you know, we used to call them the banana republic, uh, you know, behavior. So Mm -hmm. without mentioning them, all what uh, your viewers can do is go online and see which companies were about to go into the Iranian market. And not just the Iranian market, but also the Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, gas. So there is a lot of money interest in having Washington re-sign that deal, not because of the U.S. government, but because of private interest. And that, I think, is very wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, understood. Can we go about um, uh, talking about the Israeli uh, elections? Um, let's say uh, five ministers of the new cabinet of Israel are females from Arab descent, two from Moroccan descent, and three from Iraqi ancestry. Uh, you said sign if the times. So what do you mean by that? And how, how you feel about, about this election? Well, first of all, let me start with the participation of Israeli Jews from Arab ancestry. And I make a distinction between Israeli Arab speaking Jews and Arabs of Israel. These are two different matters. All what we are saying and Mm -hmm. noticing is that those Israeli citizens who are Jewish from Arab countries, like from Iraq, from Morocco, from Egypt, few from Lebanon, but many from uh, Syria, and Mm -hmm. also all the way to Sudan, and Morocco has the largest uh, community, they are now playing a greater role inside uh, Israel. There is an Arabization, if you want, of Israeli politics and culture. Even their songs, if you listen to them now, Mm -hmm. it's filled with Arabic. Now, that's a good sign. That's a good sign while it's a rapprochement between Israel and the Arab communities of the region. And that's actually a political translation of the Abraham Accord. The Abraham Accord were trying to create people to people uh, exchange and it is happening anyway. Now, how would that translate into politics? Mm -hmm. Uh, It creates new coalitions within Israel. You've asked me about the latest elections. Now, definitely there were political forces in the region and even here in America who were not happy with Bibi Netanyahu. He was too close to Trump. So they put their pressure to make sure that he's replaced. But The new prime minister actually was an assistant or was an ally to Netanyahu. And he's as tough with Iran as Bibi Netanyahu was. Mm -hmm. Now, for the next two years, because they have a system where the next two years is going to be this prime minister and the the following two years is going to be a more left-wing Israeli uh, prime minister. But I can tell you one thing. All Israeli prime ministers at this point in time do not joke about Iran. This is not something 
the consensus in Israel will accept. They will want to see Iran free of nuclear weapons and they will take action according to what they said. This is why he said and he promised the Iranians that they will not obtain a nuclear bomb. So there is no difference. Uh, Israel will be Israel against Iran. Uh, uh, nothing depending on who is the prime minister. Do you agree on that? That's right. That's what he said, yeah. We've seen it in the past, in many, many years and decades, uh, you know, it should be labor, Likud, or independent. When it comes to their national security, it's, this, it's still the same uh, response by, by the Israelis. But now there is something more important. Now there is the Abraham Accord. So there is a coordination between Israel and all those who feel aggressed by Iran in the region, including many Arab countries and uh, political parties. After the election of uh, uh... A new president. I have a quick question for you, uh, Dr. Faris. What? Uh, let me talk about uh, Turkish uh, um, American or U.S. Turkish agreement after the guys meeting with Biden. What is the new relationship coming between the two countries after this meeting? No. Uh, if you're talking about Turkey and the United States, you have the two countries, and then you have who is ruling those two countries. Hmm. Um, Turkey and the United States go back to many, many years, many decades, are members of NATO. What has changed in Turkey, not just in the United States, is the fact that the AKP ruling government, hmm. since 2003, since they came, or two, since they came to, to power, have been encouraging the Islamist agenda. Hmm. That was, have been very close to the Muslim Brotherhood. They got into problems with most of the countries in the region, with Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Libya, Egypt and, and way beyond. Uh, the past administration tried to fix those relationships. This administration is trying to do the same. But the real change will have to be done by the Turks themselves, you know, at the ballot boxes, in elections. And I think that civil society in Turkey is ready now to see change coming to that country, which by itself will correct the relationship with the United States and with Europe as well. Yeah. Do you think that uh, Erdogan is a reliable adversary or, or, or how we can understand this, this meeting results? Look, President Erdogan is very pragmatic. His first and most important goal is to maintain himself and his party in power. So there is room to maneuver, but he has to feel on behalf of the United States and the Arab world that there is steadfast position. It's like with Iran, if you give up too much, he will continue to take. I think the Arab countries, Saudi, UAE, and Egypt, showed a very strong position. And you can see that Ankara is now going back and negotiating with those three countries, even at the expense of, uh, of Qatar. I don't think this is the final stage, but mm -hmm. it would be incumbent on Washington and the Biden administration to stand with the Arab coalition mm -hmm. in their negotiations with, with Turkey. Taking a question from the audience, after the election of a new Iranian president, who sees attacks on Saudi lands increased? What is the message? The problem has been, my friend, that there was a mistake done by removing the Houthi terrorist organization from the U.S. terror list to begin with. When, when you do it, and then what is your pressure? What is your leverage on the Houthis? And as for Iran, the more you engage the Houthis before disarming them, before they feel, the more they feel strong. And they start to send their ballistic missiles. Imagine there is an organization sending ballistic missiles and drones into the depths of uh, Saudi Arabia. That is something that should have not even been contemplated, unfortunately. And you can't have a political solution between a terror organization lobbing missiles on Riyadh and other parts of uh, Yemen uh, before they are disarmed. So here's where the problem, problem is. I have a very uh, important question. In the Middle East, we can see now emerging powers like UAE who are heavily investing in space technology yeah. and has developed. How can U.S. reposition itself with these powers and what is the vision for the region in the view of this new administration? I have experienced and witnessed the development of modernity and more important of human vision of the leadership of the UAE since at least 2016, when I visited for the first time, met with the foreign minister, with the leader of the country, and again, for all these years. What we're witnessing in the UAE is something very unique in the Arab world. It's the vanguard, avant-garde in French. It's a vanguard of modernization. It's a vanguard of political reforms. And it's the vanguard of peacemaking. Now, we are all happy that the UAE has excellent relations with Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Egypt. So it is really a kind of playing a very important role in the region. 
under the previous administration, there was there were excellent relationship, and they were planning on doing four more years of these. As you just said, um, UAE is in space. UAE is in you know vir virtual intelligence. It's now leading the path for economic normalization with Israel, and it is part of our defense in the, in the region as well. I hope that the Biden administration will appreciate what is happening in the UAE. I call it the, the Dubai revolution and stand with the UAE and equip it with what it needs, including for its uh, own defenses in terms of Air Force and, and other ways of defending itself. F-35, do you have anything to comment on it? The F-35 issue, I have said it many, 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 you know, many years ago in general for, in terms of weaponizing or supporting the UAE, but most recently since the Abraham Accord, I think we should trust the UAE. They have demonstrated that they understand the threat. I personally, for the first time in my, uh, in, in my professional life, noted that in 2014, the first Arab country that issues, issued the longest, most comprehensive list of terrorist organizations, both working with the Brotherhood, with Al-Qaeda and Iran, was Abu Dhabi. So I think we, we need to trust them uh, and then deal with them as we do with Israel and other allied in, allies in Europe. Mm -hmm. My last question in this episode, you said when radical, real radicals uh, accuse their opponents of being radical, it's called political narcissism. Can you elaborate more on this issue? <laughs> it's self-explained, but let me say what the radicals, the modern neo-radicals are trying to do in the West and here in the United States, mm. every time people who call for freedom in the Middle East or for more freedoms here at home, they call them radicals. And I'm talking about the Washington Post, New York Times, you know, uh, all these uh, networks, CNN and others. What that betrays, what that shows is that the writers of this, these accusations are themselves working on behalf of the radicals because we discover that they are doing this in order to bash or criticize those criticizing the Iran deal. So the Iran deal and the huge budgets that have been spent on media, both in the Middle East and the West, are behind this accusation of radicals. And these are the radicals, basically, who are trying to promote such ideas. Mm -hmm. Walid Faris, uh, thank you so much for being with us in the Capital TV show. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.